Episode 136 of CPP Cast with guest Jonathan Mueller, recorded January 31st, 2018. This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. CPP Cast is also sponsored by Embo++. The upcoming conference will be held in Bochum, Germany from March 9th to 11th. Meet other embedded systems developers working on microcontrollers, alternative kernels, and highly customizable zero-cost library designs. Get your ticket today at embo.io. In this episode, we talk about GCC updates and a code review of Beast. And we talk to returning guest, Jonathan Mueller. Jonathan talks to us about his experience in university and some of his new projects. Welcome to episode 136 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing, Rob? I'm doing okay. No real news for me to share. You have anything coming up soon? Um, no, I did just get back from, from uh, training that I did in Bellingham, Washington. It was pretty fun. They had, uh, I was set up by Faith Life, which is a small company up there. Well, actually, it's a large company in the area. And they uh, opened it up to anyone in the community who wanted to come also through their local meetup. So that was a fun like C++ seminar that I did for a day. Nice. Did you have many people taking them up on that offer from like, non-employees coming in? Uh, well, uh, 10 people signed up on the meetup page and one person showed up. So, um, but I still thought it was, it was a great idea that they did that. Yeah. It's a nice idea. They just need to publicize it a bit more, I guess. Well, it's also, like I said, a small community. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, at the top first, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week I saw a tweet, uh, from Izzy who we had on late last year. And she said that she's been planning on getting this all set up for a few months now but decided that she's going to start developing the build system slash package manager that she announced on the podcast uh, live on Twitch. Um, so she's trying to get her network set up correctly, but she's going to, I guess, start live coding uh, this new build system on Twitch. That's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, I hope she goes through with that and starts working on it soon. Yeah. And I hope she gets her um, issues sorted out with, buffering and such that it's she says on there because uh, last time i tried to tr play with the live streaming stuff like my audio would get out of sync after about 45 minutes i don't know why yeah, that'd be pretty frustrating yeah yeah well if she uh does go through with this and start uh doing it we'll, we'll definitely share links to her twitch stream on the show mm -hmm. okay well we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well you can always reach out to us on facebook twitter or emails at feedback at cpcast.com and don't forget to leave us a review on itunes joining us again today is jonathan mueller jonathan is a cs student passionate about c plus in his spare time he writes libraries like funathan memory which provides memory allocator implementations he's also working on standard ease which is a documentation generator specifically designed for c plus Jonathan tweets at Foonathan and blogs about various C++ and library development related topics at Foonathan.net. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for joining us again. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so have you been having fun at university since you started, since we last talked? Yeah, I'm having fun. It's, well, fun is relative. It's, it's hard stuff. The math part is really hard, but I'm having fun, yeah. Oh, very good. Well, we'll talk more about that when we actually get into the interview, but... Yeah. Well, we have uh, just a couple news articles to discuss. Obviously, feel free to comment on any of these, Jonathan. Then, like Jason said, we'll start talking more about uh, what you've been up to lately, okay? Okay. Okay, so this first one is uh, GCC 7.3 has been released. And the big takeaway here is that uh, there are latest update does include options to mitigate uh, Spectre Variant 2 
for it's specifically for x86 and power pc targets right yeah. they also did fix 99 other bugs though right mostly a bug fix release mostly a bug fix release one of them stands out to me what would that be temporary object created as a default argument not destructed Anything that says a destructor might not be called is a terrifying bug to me, given yeah. that this is C++. Right, right. That's, <laughs> that's pretty important. I'm glad they're able to get that fixed. Okay. Anything stand out to you, Jonathan? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Okay. Okay. Okay, next article is on Code Project, which I thought was interesting to see that people are still putting new things on Code Project. But uh, this is the Erase, Remove, Idiom, <laughs> Revisited. Um, Jason, do you want to talk about this one? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I checked this out, and I think the main thing about it that I found interesting was apparently Arthur O'Dwyer, who is a regular speaker at conferences. We've not had him on the show, correct? No, we haven't. And I noticed he was mentioned here, too. I didn't realize he, he wrote a book on the STL. Right, so he recently wrote a book, Mastering the C++ 7 STL, and apparently he's got an unstable remove uh, proposal for the standard that could potentially make the remove algorithms um, much faster if you're not worried about keeping the relative ordering of things when you use the remove idiom, which um, I guess I didn't describe, but I could. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so the erase remove idiom, or... If I, yes, you, you run the algorithm that you want that's going to remove a bunch of things. And what it does is it orders them all at the end of the list, then returns back to an iterator of the first thing that ends to actually be erased. And then you call erase on your container and then it just deletes the tail of it. And this is to solve the problem with iterators being invalidated when you erase something from the middle of a container. Okay. Yeah, that definitely sounds useful. Yes. Yeah, we should uh, try to get Arthur on the show and talk about his proposal and his book. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the unstable remove thing, um, it reminds me of a container. It's called bag or something. This is basically a wrapper over a vector, but all of elements doesn't matter. It just matters whether or not an element is inside. And the erase operation of it is exactly that. It just simply swaps it with the last element and does a pop back because the order of the elements inside the container doesn't matter. Interesting. So how do you actually, uh, like, I don't know, find an element or whatever? You don't find it. It's just like you have a list of things, and later you want to iterate over all of them. Okay. But you don't really care about whether or not one. You just want to have a collection of things. So effectively, all the operations on it are unstable operations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or hmm. insert is just a pushback, and erase is just a hopback. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, next thing we have here is a non-traditional source code review, and this is in reference to the Beast library that we talked with uh, Vinny Falco about a while back. And apparently he, he submitted the library to get reviewed by this company, Bishop Fox, which I had not heard of before, but I guess they do security reviews. And he had them do a security review of Beast, and uh, they found a couple flaws, which he went ahead and fixed prior to that library going into Boost uh, with its 1.0 version. And he went ahead and published all their findings, which is interesting to see. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, neat when companies get involved in the open source world like that also. Yeah. And then, do you have something to say, Jonathan? Uh, no. no. Okay. okay. Uh, and then the last thing... <clears throat> Is this article on CppCon 2017, uh, inclusiveness, accessibility, and CppCon 2017 videos. And two major announcements here. Uh, one is that they just finished uploading all the CppCon 2017 videos onto Channel 9. Uh, they had already been on YouTube for a couple months, obviously, but now you can get them on Channel 9, too. And the nice thing about that is Channel 9 uh, allows you to do offline viewing. You can just download the whole video, which is great. And then the other announcement is uh, they have now uh, closed captioned all the video, uh, professionally captioned them. So when you're looking at YouTube, you'll see uh, professional captions, not just the auto-generated ones. So it's really great for uh, you know anyone with hearing problems. There's also uh, the fact that YouTube is blocked or restricted in some countries, and Channel 9 is restricted yes. in fewer countries. So it makes the CBPCon videos more widely available. Yes, absolutely. 
Okay, I think that's it for the news. Um, Jonathan, what can you tell us a little bit about how uh, C++ is being taught at your university, what your experience has been like so far? Um, I study at the RWTH in Aachen, and I picked it because it's a very theoretical university. It's not really practical, so there isn't re there aren't re really any programming le lectures at this university. There's there's obviously one in the first semester. It's a lecture called programming, and they cover Java, Haskell, and Prolog. Oh wow! And this the first semester there they teach you programming, and then in the second semester you have a course about operating systems, and then you have to do some C for the exercises. So they give a two hour introduction into C, and that's basically it. And on the th third semester. Semester I just finished. Um, an ec ec uh, we had to program a microcontroller in C for a couple of weeks, and for that we basically had to learn C ourselves completely. So they didn't really teach us only the microcontroller stuff. Well, that's. I mean, I figure a two-hour lecture should be pretty much enough to become an expert in C. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? I mean, it's not C plus so. plus. <laughs> I am curious what uh, microcontroller architecture they had you working with. Uh, it's a 16-bit microcontroller. I forgot exactly okay. what, what it's called. But it was fun. We had to do like scheduling work and implement a malloc and stuff like that. So, did you go for this university, which you said is you know they they teach mostly theoretical classes? Did you go for that because you already had such a good foundation in C++? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to go to university, and then they have, like, four lectures about advanced Java programming techniques and stuff <laughs> like that. I don't really care about that, so I picked it, yes. Uh, it's it's a uh, heavy focus on math and theoretical computer science and things like that. So I, I guess we should maybe back up just a moment. What? Uh, how long have you been in university now? Uh, the third sem semester just ended. Third semester just into it. Okay, right. All right, so you're starting your fourth semester soon. Yeah, first the exam, then the fourth, fourth semester in around April. Okay. What um, what kind of experience do you think the other students are having? Like, do you think you're kind of a common case where you came in already knowing at least one programming language pretty well? Or are a lot uh, of students having to self-teach themselves while learning all this theoretical stuff during their class Mo time? Most uh, students ha had uh, computer science at school, and then there they learned Java, mainly some Pascal, so they know something about programming, but mostly they had to teach themselves, mainly C, uh, for the third semester. So, yeah. you know, It's been a really long time since I was in school. Uh, what is from you said computer science uh, classes at in secondary school right and yeah, high school, school. Yeah. Um, so uh, did you take any of those classes also I did we did uh, stuff in Pascal and that surprises me yeah we, uh, just, we were the, the last year where it was allowed and the teacher didn't really want to do Java so he used Pascal and we were the last year and now that he has to do Java <laughs> that's interesting. So he it just it like Pascal, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> I've heard things about his. Yeah, well, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, maybe we shouldn't get into that. Um, yeah. It, so you're uh, you would say that the German computer science secondary school classes are good enough preparation for a computer science programming that you would need in a theoretical pro discipline like you're starting in. Well, it's they have spent enough time on the basic concepts of program that you don't get completely lost in the lectures, but it's still a different level. Okay. Right. It's kind that of like sense. the same with math. I mean, you know how to integrate something, but the lecture is a completely different level of, so, yeah. Right. And the, the classes you took in, uh, in high school, were those considered like elective classes or was the majority of students, uh, taking some type of programming course? Uh, what do you mean exactly? Uh, elective as in like an optional class that you took during uh, high school as opposed they, to being part of the curriculum. They counted as a natural science, so most okay. of them oh. just picked them because they didn't want to have physics. Or, or chemistry or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've always wondered if it should count as a foreign language requirement <laughs> instead of a science requirement. Yeah, well, 
it would have definitely helped, I think, for some people. <laughs> if they could get rid of English or something and they instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say that having taken German when I was in high school, but I did pass those classes. So don't test me on my knowledge, though. <laughs> so what are uh, your other classes like? Um, the, these theoretical classes, are you learning about, you know, like modern techniques or is it, you know, more abstract concepts? Like I think you said operating systems. Yeah, there we are. Um, it's roughly the, we have four kinds of lectures. We have the practical programming ones, the theoretical uh, computer science, uh, the uh, technical computer science. I think is it called and math. Uh, the practical programming, there were like the programming lecture, and then the second semester there were data structures and algorithms, things like that. And then the third semester we had a lecture about UML diagrams, which wasn't that interesting. <laughs> but the uh, the the technical programming we start like with the um, electronic stuff of computers and logic gates and the operating course both in that department. So there they uh, next year I think it's uh, networking and internet lecture mandatory. And in the theoretical computer science, well you have like yeah uh, com complexity and Turing machines and regular languages and things like that. Well, and then you have math. Always in the math. Yeah, yeah, it's a heavy math. It's, it was nice. I recently bought Element of Programming, mm -hmm. and I knew everything for, of the math side for my first semester lecture. I also own Elements of Programming. Uh, however, it had been at least 10 years since I was out of university before I picked up the book, and I look at it and I say, this is going to take more work than I want it to take. <laughs> yeah, for me it was a nice read, because I was familiar. Oh, I had this, I had that. It was there, there. It was a really hard first semester lecture, but it was totally worth it. Good, that's good. Um, how's it been going to some of the conferences uh, as a student volunteer and speaker? It's great. I can only recommend it. It's amazing. I, I want to go to as many as possible. It's just great. <laughs> so, uh, what conferences did you go to last year? Uh, last year, I went to CPP Now and Meeting C++. Okay. And what's uh, what's the experience like as a student volunteer? I mean, like, what what are you what do you do? What are you required to do? Uh, at CPP now, as a student volunteer, well, we had to do like uh, set up things before the conference. We put the names and the badges and stuff like that, and carry things around. And then during the conference, we had to hold up the signs or help with the food preparations. It it it's not too much work. Okay, it's just. And you were kind of wearing two badges since you were also speaking, right? Yeah, yeah, I was also speaking, but which was, yeah. it was a little weird because <laughs> most people coming, a lot of people coming knew me, and so. Uh, so uh, when you when you do that, does the conference pay for your hotel, travel, whatever? Uh, uh, it varies from time to time. Uh, this year, for example, at Meeting C++, they paid for... Um, the hotel, but I had to pay for travel, which wasn't, it's just a train ride. But last right. year I had to pay for a hotel myself. And this is sort of problematic because the hotel is really expensive. And <laughs> I'm a student, so. But yeah. in C++ now, the hotel. In C++ now, they pay everything for the volunteers if you ask them, which is great. Yeah, this sounds like a great commercial at this point. If you're a student and you're listening and you haven't <laughs> signed up to for the volunteer program, maybe you should do that. I don't think it's open. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not open yet. They just closed the call for submissions. Uh, did you submit a talk? I for submitted C++? a talk, yes. Okay. And I also uh, have a talk at ACCU coming up. Okay, and so that one's definite because ACCU is very yeah, soon, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm on the schedule on uh, and like Wednesday at 4 or so. What are you doing a talk on? I'm talking about pointers and references and optional references and string views and when to use which one and why not the one and what's about byte and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think you at some point, oh, it's been a while now, wrote an article raising awareness to the fact that string view can easily create a yeah. view of a temporary. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about this kind of stuff. Basically, like, do we need an optional TWF or this just a pointer? Or do we? Things like that. Uh, it was an explicit decision from the committee to not allow optional references, right? Yeah, because because of the assignment issue. Uh, what, uh, what should an optional do on a assign to the reference or rebind the reference? Because references are kind of weird. 
But um, let's say we figure that out. Should we still add it, or could we just use a pointer? I mean, because an optional reference is a pointer with a special value, so what's really the difference in elaborating on that semantic aspect of Well, do you want to give us a preview as to uh, what you are going to say? Yeah, for example, um, I'm basically going to analyze the different properties the objects have. So like the a pointer, a reference, and then I'm going to look at various situations where we might want to use one over the others. And for example, um, in my opinion, I think we need an optional tree reference for semantic purposes because it has a different semantic meaning than a pointer. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to elaborate much more on that in the talk. So you think we do need it, but how does that then compare to like an optional reference wrapper? Yeah, that's also a reference. Yeah, this is the kind of questions I'm going to answer in that talk. Okay. I mean, I can go on here, but then we'll get sidetracked and talking about reference. <laughs> I don't know whether, whether that's the point. <laughs> well, you know, it's just an interesting topic. So if there's yeah, anything yeah. else you want to add about it, or we can move on. Yeah, I think it's a great talk. I've also submitted something similar to C++ now, but on the like higher level of C++ now, this is HCCU is more for like a guide which one to use. And then at uh, C++ now, I want to talk about um, the underlying concepts a little bit more and what and things like yeah. So more uh, at the C++ now level than at HCCU. Yeah, I, uh, it seems like a lot of talks at C++ now end up kind of almost with like uh, the committee needs to take an action here, kind <laughs> of. By, by the time you're done with your talk, this is what needs to change in the language yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is a debugging platform that improves software quality, reliability, and support by bringing deep introspection and automation throughout the software error lifecycle. Spend less time debugging and reduce your mean time to resolution by using the first and only platform to combine symbolic debugging, error aggregation, and state analysis. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of application and environmental state. Backtrace then performs automated analysis on process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. This data is aggregated and archived in a centralized object store, providing your team a single system to investigate errors across your environments. Join industry leaders like Fastly, Message Systems, and AppNexus that use Backtrace to modernize their debugging infrastructure. It's free to try, minutes to set up, fully featured with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. Uh, I wanted to ask about this blog post you wrote a couple months ago after meeting C++ 2017 uh, about what should be part of the standard library. Um, and you wrote this kind of in response to the graphics 2D proposal that was discussed yeah, yeah. at meeting C++. Yeah, I was, uh, Guy Davidson gave a talk at meeting C++ about the 2D graphics proposal and he sort of addressed because, I mean, when you give a talk about it, the obvious question is why should we put graphics in the standard library? And she talked about it a little bit. It's something nice for beginners. You don't have to do console applications, but you can simply do graphics or maybe things like PDF output someone brought up where you don't really need to have that this much performance because obviously, if you're writing a game, a high-level uh, game, you wouldn't really want to use it. You use a specialized engine because it's not fitted for your kind of hardware usage. So that, so this whole discussion got me thinking about what should be part of the standard library, um, because it, this is based on a world where we um, where we have a perfect package manager and it's no problem to install an external library. <laughs> If we, then we can get rid of the old, yeah, well, it's too convenient. We need it all the time. So it ha put, needs to put in the standard library because it's just a pain to get this external library in every program where you want to use a vector, for example. So we can sidestep that issue. And then in theory, I mean, you wouldn't need anything in the standard library. But then, for example, you have like, um, you have code dealing with strings. And then every project, there are probably multiple competing string libraries. And then you have this library that uses this string library, and then you have the other library using a different string library. So you want to integrate them both in your program and constantly have to convert between the strings back and forth in your own program. So it would be really great if there was like a vocabulary string type in the standard library, because then everyone would have a common 
interface. And this doesn't, wouldn't even need to be a standard string. Standard string view would, would be enough for most cases because then we'll have like, this is a string, we can pass it around and things like that. So this is what I talked about in the blog post that standard library in this perfect world really should only contain the general vocabulary types needed to have a common. Right. So your point is that getting the standard vocabulary types out of something like a graphics library, like a standard point, yeah. Yeah, is for kind example. of more important than having the graphics library itself as part of the standard? Yeah, yeah. It's it's really, I think the better value of the 2D graphics is not like, here we can use this implementation to render things, but like the, this is a point, this is a color that you can maybe use in a different engine that is more optimized for your use case and you can... Okay. Uh, I'm, I find myself wondering... Because uh, you know, uh, there's been talks like at CP CPP Con now, excuse me, CPP Con, <laughs> about this, where like uh, Facebook has their own strings implementations internally because they've got their requirements and they need to trim a billionth of a microsecond off of each operation. And then you know, you uh, talk to some game programmers and they're like, "Well, we have to completely re-implement the STL because it doesn't meet our specific requirements." And I totally agree with you. I like the idea of having this common vocabulary of points and whatever. But I wonder if the main people who would want to use that vocabulary would be like, well, your point is less efficient than my point because it uses one extra bit than it needs to. So I'm going to re-implement it. And, you know, I don't know. I'm yeah. feeling slightly cynical about this, I guess. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I think for something like, yeah, okay, it's not even as simple as a point because do you use flow, do you use double, do you use integer coordinates, so this is the whole issue. But maybe a string view, I mean, it's just a pointer and the size. Well, unless you right. want to null terminate a string view, then it's just a pointer. So, yeah, it's, it's a difficult problem. But I think there's something enough for 90% of the use cases and the remaining 10%, they just use their own. So I think that's good enough. So outside of agreeing that there should be a vocabulary for some of these 2D graphic things like there is for strings, do you see other parts of the standard library where we could use like a common vocabulary that we need one, that is? Uh, common. So you mean like what are vo vocabulary types currently missing in the standard library? Right. Is that what you're asking? Um, well, I can't really think of any out of, out the top of my head. That's fine. Yeah, maybe, maybe like a s streaming reading interface that's not standard stream of would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people don't like uh, IO streams, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember reading the book about IO streams and I was like amazed a couple of years ago about what they can do and how they're designed and the local stuff, but I get why people don't like it <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> Uh, when we had you on the first time, I think we mostly talked about uh, your standard ease and memory libraries. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other newer projects that you want to talk about? Um, well, out of standard in standard ease, I used uh, LibClang to pass the source files and generate the synopsis. And I quickly found that that LibClang isn't that well maintained compared to the other Clang tools. So it only provides a limited interface and couldn't give me all information. For example, didn't give me the full now except expressions of a function. So for those, I just went ahead and get, get the tokens and manually looked for a no except in there and passed that if that was the case. And then there were also like, but they're not really bugs, but inconsistencies in the APIs. So I had to work on those and quickly the parsing code became like so complex. I had like the workaround for this issue and how do I get this? And this was a lot and lot of work workarounds. So uh, I, I think last summer I decoupled all that parsing code into a separate project, uh, CPP AST. It's, um, it's basically a high level wrapper over libclang. But I designed it completely agnostic, so it, I've defined a separate est, and then it's simply used libclang to build the est, but you can also use libtooling to build the est, so it's not dependent on how the est gets created, but it's just a high-level abstract representation of a program, and then I have some utility functions. So I did that, and then for my uh, meeting C++ talk, uh, this 
last year, um, so the last meeting C++, I talked about attributes because I realized that with this um, parsing library, I can simply extract attributes. And since C++ 17, uh, if the compiler doesn't know an attribute, it is required to ignore the attribute. So you can basically define your own attributes simply by using them. And then you can use, for example, a CPP AST based tool to pass those attributes. And uh, I talked about how you can do reflection and things like that. And I believe Mano at the moment is working on it heavily using CPP AST and doing reflection stuff. So it's a useful library. I saw recently a tweet from Manu uh, Sanchez yeah, you're yeah. referring to the, yeah, about it. how, uh, High, highly he uh, regards your library. Yeah. Be because if you do advanced the Clang stuff, you quickly find out that it's not really that great. And it's the reason <laughs> they recommend that you should use lib tooling. And I should have used lib tooling, but instead I fixed it. And so I have this fix anyway, so I just extracted it so others can use it. So if I wanted to use CPPAST in a project tomorrow, what would I need to do? How hard is it to build with all the dependencies for LLVM or whatever? Yeah, well, you need LLVM, and otherwise there's just some header-only or two-file libraries that get CMake does it automatically. So it should work out of the box if you have oh. LLVM installed on a Linux machine. On Windows, it's installed in a weird way. <laughs> but it, it can work? It, it, can, it can work. I have it working on a player. I never was able to build it locally on my Windows, though. So. Oh, okay, very good. Um, did we talk about your compatibility library yet? I see that listed on your project. Oh, page. yeah, yeah. This was this was an uh, old library. I haven't done anything with it for a couple of years, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, it was it was um, it was basically I wasn't aware of the SD fourteen feature macros at the time, so it was basically a CMake library that. Um, tries to compile some program using noexcept, for example, and based on the fact whether or not compiled, it deduces whether your compiler supports noexcept, and then it defines the appropriate feature macro for you. So it's, you can do, I use it in memory, um, so to check like, does this compiler support const expire at a CMake level? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, other big library I did, I think, yeah, it was after I was here, was type safe. Um, it started, I think, out of a blog post on error handling. Um, I wrote a couple of blog posts about error handling. And then the last one, I talked about how you can use like um, optional return types to pre prevent precondition errors and things like that. And out of that, type safe was born. It is a library. It provides a couple of utilities for, I call it type safe programming. So you have like integers that don't do dangerous implicit conversions, or you have like, uh, Strong type devs implementation, which is the thing I most regularly use out of TypeSafe. This is a really great uh, way to do uh, strong type devs. It's similar to um, uh, Jonathan from Fluent C++. He does also some stuff on strong types. It's similar to that, but implemented in a slightly different manner and have things like that. And they're also my optional and variant implementation. It sort of became my go-to library for I want to have this utility thing, but I don't want to start a new library, so I just throw it in there and tell it <laughs> Swift type safety. <laughs> I'm curious, you, you mentioned a moment ago that as of C17, uh, the compiler is required to ignore any attributes that it doesn't know. Mm -hmm. um, so we as programmers can just like put stuff in attribute blocks just we for the fun of it. Yes, yes. I gave a meeting C++ talk, fun with user-defined attributes, where I did exactly that. It's not online yet. Okay. but uh, So I I'm, I want to dig into that just a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. what does that mean? I mean, like, doesn't the standard reserve the right to use attribute names in the future? It's... I don't know whether it actually does, but the attribute syntax is surprisingly powerful. For example, you have namespaces. Oh. And I don't think the standard will ever add an attribute with a namespace, so you can simply invent your own namespace and use it. So you, okay. while it's not really namespaces, you just write name, colon, colon, other name. So, and that's the attribute name. And you can also um, have arguments to an attribute. So you can, for example, deprecate it gets a message. 
the, the deprecated attribute gets a message, but the argument is actually just an arbitrary sequence of tokens, so you can put anything in there. It's a really powerful tool. Sounds abusable. <laughs> it's really abusable, yes, yes. I had yeah. I'm also curious about some of the uh going back to your university experience mm -hmm. now, you said that it sounds like everything that you've done that's low level has been in C at yes. university. Yes. Now, I, I, I was asking what microcontroller you're programming on because I was curious if it had like a clang target. Like, if you had wanted to, could you have used C? I'm pretty sure we, we used GCC, so I'm we could, probably That's... could have used C. Okay, yeah, if it's a GCC target, then you almost yeah, certainly could yeah, have. Yeah. But uh, you weren't allowed to for the projects? We had to use C. They even, they, yeah, we had to use C. They even provided a couple of code templates we had to use. So we had to, I don't know which C standard we used. They were kind of like inconsistent with their own code. So the <laughs> templates did use the slash slash comments, but they declared variables in the middle of a function. So okay. it's, I'm not really sure which C standard they are going with. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. It's a shame that they didn't actually provide you templates instead of just code no, templates. No, they provided <laughs> code templates. I, d I did a lot of fun with macro meta programming for register stuff because, well, I'm a C++ programmer, I guess. <laughs> Do you have any idea why they are having you use C and, and not allowing C++? Uh, I think the professor that organizes it doesn't like C++. Just doesn't like it. Okay. That's, um, uh, do you know, like moving forward, uh, as you get higher, uh, levels in, at, in your curriculum, are you able to choose what language you do use to implement your projects? Um, I think it depends. There are definitely some, uh, for example, graphics courses where we have to use C++. Oh, okay. And you can also, I'm not sure whether we have to do a project, uh, but I'm not sure whether or not they uh, require a given programming language for that. Sounds like there could be a market there for you to uh, do C++ tutoring once it gets to that point. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've done enough C tutoring. In the, and basically my C tutoring starts with, well, if C++ you wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, you would have three others. And, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything else you want to share, like recent blog posts, upcoming talks that we haven't already gone over? Yeah, well, uh, I've, I have the talk coming up at SCCU and hopefully C++ now. Um, I might even go to CPPCon this year. Depends how the exams work out. And, yeah, well, blog post. If if I knew last week that I was going to see a uh, CPP cast, I would have written a different blog post <laughs> than the one I wrote. <laughs> so we could have talked about that. Um, I don't even know what the last one was. But, yeah, yeah, well. um, I might have, oh, uh, I started a Patreon. Uh, oh, right. Uh, in December, It's it's been great so far. I have like nine people supporting us, so, which is, which, it's it's great. And That's pretty cool support, yeah. Yeah. to uh, support you with writing blog posts and your open source projects, basically. Yeah, yeah. I have my Patreon organized in a different way. Uh, if you pay more money, you can select which projects you want to support. And when I want to work, have spare time, I'll kind of look at that list and pick which project I use based on the data there. Uh, oh. So it's like voting what projects yeah, you work yeah, on. Yeah, it's like voting, but you have to give me uh, at least $4 for that. <laughs> <laughs> voting with your wallet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so, swing. Oh, go ahead, Jason. No, you, you mentioned that you might go to CVPCon if you can because of your university schedule. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was actually wondering about that, how much this traveling has affected your university classes. Yeah, for example, uh, for CPP now, I was gone an entire week. And that was it, during the middle of school. It was during the middle of school, yes, yes. It was not a big problem per se. The uh, Some lectures are recorded. Uh, for oh. others, it's not a problem because they have an extensive script or, or something. The only issue was we uh, had this one professor in the um, exercises. He required us to do them in pairs. And every partner has mm. to had to write an equal amount. So I spent... Like, 
so I had to do an, uh, the exercise before CPP now immediately in, in a couple of hours and submit it, <laughs> which was a little bit stressful. But otherwise, it's not a big deal as long as I don't miss every week, but they're not. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on again today, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.